All right, welcome everyone to our, um, our QA Discover seminar today. Recall that the intent of the Discover series is to expose College of Medicine researchers to other researchers and resources across Penn State. So today's a great example of how we can do that. Um, I'm very excited um, to have uh, Dr. Uh, Seth Bordenstein today. I had heard him speak uh, several months ago, and I thought that this was really um, somebody you would enjoy and also would be great opportunity for him to begin to form more connections at the College of Medicine. So he is a lateral thinker and recognized leader in the centrality of microorganisms to the biosphere and human health. He has studied uh, symbiotic interactions between animals and microbes for 25 years, and his mission is to research the important keystones that we should already know about in textbooks and research specialties using these microorganisms to control like mosquito-borne diseases and understanding microbiome diversity across all of us and accelerating major trends in, in host-associated microbiomes. So he was recruited to Penn State, as I mentioned, just about eight months ago, as the director of the Microbiome Center at Penn State. And I'm gonna let him tell you more about that as he goes on here. He is a professor in the departments of biology and entomology, and uh, as a, well as the former and founding director of the worldwide uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute initiated science education program, Discover the Microbes Within, the Woe Bacteria Project. He is the recipient of the 2014 Jeffrey Nordhaus Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching. And you'll understand why that is after you hear him speak. And the Chancellor's Award for Research and the Chancellor Fellow Faculty Award from Vanderbilt University. He is 2020 Genetic Society of America Award of Excellence in Education and the 2020 Centennial Endowed Professorship and 2022 Dorothy Fur Heck and Lloyd J. Huck endowed chair in microbiome sciences. So I am gonna stop my nonsense and move on to uh, welcome Dr. Bordenstein and uh, kick the seminar off. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I am very excited to be here. Uh, some, of the, some of the most exciting things happening in the microbiome space are uh, happening at the, at, the, at the College of Medicine and at the University Park and synergies between them. So I hope to inspire some of that conversation, and I am very keen to hear uh, what Penn State can do more in terms of bringing the microbiome sciences to its fullest and to making stronger synergies uh, on top of already good ones that exist. So without further ado, I'll introduce the Microbiome Center a little bit, and then I'll talk about uh, some of our research in human microbiome diversity. Uh, so uh, as many of you may be aware, our Microbiome Center is one of the largest and most active centers in this field right now today. Uh, we have 115 faculty, and we have 500 plus total members who kind of make this whole thing one of the big life sciences uh, operations uh, at Penn State. We are housed within the Huck Institutes of the Life Sciences, and we share their very symbiotic and transdisciplinary uh, vision of integrating the life sciences uh, without bias to system, without bias to phenotype, et cetera. So this is our mission statement. Uh, these are the four areas that we are focused in and categorize uh, our activities in and like to think about. Um, I won't have the time to go through in detail, but just gives you a sense that we're operating in all of these four spaces. And if we had a motto, I think our motto would encapsulate the Penn State motto a little bit of making life better. And that what we're really, really interested in the center is enhancing life from the microbes on up. Uh, and that can happen in soil, human guts, uh, plants and animals, et cetera. I want to bring your attention to our amazing Microbiome Center Executive Committee. It really does represent the depth of what our venerable organization uh, brings to the microbiome sciences. 15 faculty who represent the 13 departmental affiliations that you can see here, including your very own Guy Townsend from Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Um, we have seven colleges represented, three Penn State campuses, including Altoona from Corianne Bakermans. Uh, and this is uh, just a sliver of the activity that we see in our in our microbiome center. The faculty are a host to uh, a, a vibrant training group, and we have undergraduates to graduate students 
who are involved in three very well uh, established and resourced clubs coming out of the COVID pandemic. And they have a sense of renewed energy. And I encourage uh, any of the trainees who aren't affiliated, but would like to be with the Microbiome Center or Microbiology in general, these are your groups. If you can't find them online, just ping me and I will help you do that. This is our graduate student club, Macrobes from Microbes. Uh, some of their uh, goals are listed in these uh, bacteria-shaped uh, colors. We also have uh, really what I think is a crown jewel of the Penn State Microbiome Center. Our trainees actually formed a data analysis working group called DOG for short, D-A-W-G, and they provide microbiome analytic assistance to labs that are just getting started in the microbiome sciences and will uh, benefit from the leadership they have and also the collaborations and co-authorships uh, they participate in in these projects. Uh, this is just the beauty of what we do, and our training is so strong that our our, our graduate students and uh, can real and our postdocs can fuel the development of research projects in our, in our labs. There's a emerging undergraduate group that's coming with a lot of enthusiasm too. They're uh, formally affiliated with the American Society for Microbiology. It's the Penn State unit, um, and they have a lot of aspirations to get into research labs, to connect with faculty, and have casual chats. Uh, among many other ideas. So again, uh, if you're interested in finding trainees, we have these groups to reach out to. And if the trainees want to become a part of these groups, um, let's definitely make that happen. So the center's uh, North Star vision uh, is that we will define uh, and be the great microbiome center of the 21st century. And I totally believe that we're already doing some of this and we can do a bit more of it. Uh, there's always a task ahead, but we do have one of the most fine organizations in this field. Um, why is that? Well, our scholar and scholarship really speaks for itself uh, and that's our bread and butter. But also we are you know, committed to education. We have the first dual title degree, PhD degree in the world, which means that our graduate students can now graduate from their primary graduate program say a PhD in biology and then the microbiome sciences. Uh, this puts our training and their expertise front and center for their next career steps. Uh, as I mentioned, we're one of the largest and most active centers and we have strengths uniquely, not just um, as an aside, but uniquely in One Health, which means that we cover human health, agricultural health and environmental health with the great depths of our, of our scholars in the center. Uh, and I think that's a brand that uh, we should really get strongly behind because it uh, encapsulates recruitment for us, uh, North Star visions and aspirations of where we want to go with synergies and connecting microbial ecology from, let's say, the soil to agricultural to human health all in one big sweep. Um, yeah, and we do this with uh, the university motto in mind. So with some of that uh, high level uh, and organizational aspects, I'll now move on to our, our lab research. But if any of this was a sort of motivation for discussion later in the talk, I'll be happy to take it in the Q&A session and we can have a lot more chat about the center. So the Bordenstein lab is grouped into three categories as I see them. Um, the first is we are very interested in the most common bacterial uh, infection slash symbiont in the planet. And that's called Wolbachia. And these don't occur in humans, they occur in arthropods, and arthropods represent 85% of all animal species. Wolbachia bacteria are in half of those arthropod species, which means millions and millions of arthropod slash animals species are uh, carrying this Wolbachia bacterial symbiont. It's vertically inherited and does some amazing things to animal sexual reproduction, uh, which is how we initially got interested in them. We're interested in microbiome patterns. Very simply, what are the rules of microbiome variation between host species? So if you take a complex of related primates, including us, or related mosquito species, or related plant species, and you draw a phylogeny of those hosts, what would you expect about their microbiomes? Would they be randomly sorted to the phylogeny, um, or would they show what we call phylosymbiosis, which is a parallel change in the microbiome as the host species change? Um, we coined this term, and it turns out to be a very common trend in the microbiome field across many systems from plant to sea, or from, sorry, from plants to animals, from sea to land and lab to the wild. But today's topic will focus on sort of the complementary question, which are what are the rules 
of microbiome variation within host species. And here uh, we're using human microbiome data largely because of the available public data, but also of course the human relevance, both health and disease relevance. So uh, for those that are uh, a little unfamiliar, I'll do a very quick overview of the, of the human microbiome and kind of what we know as the highlights that you look at on the first page of a textbook about it. Uh, first of all, we have biogeography. So our, our body sites often harbor different microbiome compositions such that the oral microbiome will be different than the skin microbiome, for example. There's a total of 40 trillion microorganisms. That's, um, uh, that's composed of about 500 to 1,000 bacterial species, um, and they comprise about half of the cells in our body. So for every one microorganism, there's one human cell, and therefore, we are truly a walking uh, ecosystem or holobiont, if you will, of part microbe and part host, part human. However, the microbes sort of win the day in terms of their genetic secrets because they, uh, among these thousand species that occur, they harbor more unique genes than our 20,000 genes in the human genome. In fact, there's a hundredfold more genes estimated in the human microbiome than in the human genome. Some may be active, some may be not active, but that genetic capacity bestows functions um, that many of us are interested in, and I think we're still trying to figure out um, where else are they interesting, what uh, phenotypes have not been studied enough from this genetic perspective. Uh, another contrast, of course, is that our human genome is very, very similar between each other, but our microbiomes are very different. And this actually is some of the uh, inspiration for why we're interested in categorizing the rules of microbiome variation between people. It's because we do have a lot of variation, and yet we don't have a good handle on what explains that variation. 90% uh, of diseases, give or take, have a microbiome association. Whether causal or correlational, um, this association is quite real. So uh, I think we're in the first decade or two of a century's worth of medical-oriented and health-oriented outcomes from the microbiome sciences. Now, if you turn to page two for the microbiome sciences, uh, you'd probably find something like this, that microbiomes across people uh, vary with geography. That makes sense for a number of reasons. Different geographies and environments will have different microbes. The people who live there will have different social um, uh, ways of living. Uh, they'll have different ancestries. Uh, they'll have different cultures. And so a lot of that drives the geographic variation. It's a multifaceted um, component. Body sites, as I mentioned, have unique or at least distinguishable microbiomes. Um, what is clear is that in westernized countries, over time, there's been a diversity decline in microbiomes um, compared to non-westernized countries. That diversity decline could associate with the overuse of medications, overuse of hygiene practices, etc. cetera. Um, and while diversity is declining in our microbiomes, chronic illnesses are increasing uh, in these westernized countries. And there's thought to be a, a pretty important relationship that's still being worked out uh, for some of these diseases. So when we started to think about microbiome variation across people, what we quickly saw in American data sets and then in global data sets is that we have a diversity problem, much like uh, genomics does. And we shouldn't have this problem, right? Because microbiomics started you know, 20 years after genomic sciences of human genomes did. But yet we're starting with that same problem. There's too many white European ancestry microbiomes in the databases right now. That's reflected by a recent article that came out in PLOS Biology in 2022 by a colleague of ours. As, as you can see in the pink here, the Europe and North American microbiome subjects are overwhelming the microbiome databases and, and studies. Um, per On a per year basis, you can see from 2010 onward that there's a general slight trend downward as we appreciate that microbiomes are heavily biased and we need to incorporate more diversity. Uh, this is what inspired some of our work that began really in 2014, 15, and I'll present some of that on where we are today. We focused on the United States because I think there's many reasons why geography contributes to microbiome variation, but when you look within one country, um, you start to confine some of that variation, uh, some of that cultural variation, some of that uh, geographic variation, but of course not all of it. There were two initial data sets that were publicly available that we grabbed to look at, were there patterns in these two vastly different data sets, sequencing different people um, with different sequencing machines, et cetera. 
Um, but one was a crowdsourcing campaign called American Gut, and one was the federally funded NIH Human Microbiome Project. We thought that we actually would not find any similarities between these two data sets. And if we didn't, that would sort of just confirm that the microbiome is a mess in humans. Um, but instead, we were quite pleased to find that there were some patterns that pointed us in a compass direction that we're still on today. So um, ultimately, we are interested in this topic because we do need to unbias microbiome studies in an urgent way. Um, we do need to consider if there's baseline differences in microbiomes between disparity groups, how they may impact then the onset or development of health disparities and disease incidence differences. Of course, that's a multifaceted topic as well that involves many aspects to why we see disparities and disease difference, incidence differences. Um, all of these need to be taken into account and really reflect that uh, the life sciences will not be able to avoid many of these geographic social science aspects as well. Uh, and I think this is a future target more than one we're going to be able to solve right now, uh, but we have to prioritize this going forward. Um, in, the, in the currently reported clinical cohort study, self-identity declared as ethnicity or race um, is the variable that is often linked to a human uh, subject. And so we have that as a label. Um, I would emphasize as we go forward in this talk that this is a social construct, not a biological one, and that it can, can captures many factors that are listed um, uh, here. And this is a wonderful article that has reflected on sort of the over-reliance of medical sciences on ethnicity and race, because ultimately it's a ghost variable. It's something that's there but it is impacted by many structural, dietary, social, cultural factors that get detailed in the longer list here that represent probably the real causes and real fundamental factors influencing why there's an ethnicity or race association, for example, with microbiomes. Uh, we are scratching the surface here. Uh, and so we used that those terms to really get a window into where we need to go. And if you look at phylum level microbiome diversity across these two data sets uh, using 16S amplicon sequencing, just a bacterial gene marker, you know, the two most common groups in the human gut are bacteroidetes and firmicutes. And generally speaking, all humans have the dominance of these two groups, but you can see that there's also variation in the abundance of these groups between um, ethnicities or races labeled here. And this just really scratches the surface. I think the phylum level information is a starting point, but we need to dig a little further into what are the sort of the consistently varying microbes at a much finer resolution. And as I mentioned, when we looked at these two data sets, we thought we would not find any trends, any consistencies. But instead, what we found is that there were 12 reoccurring microbes at the genus or family level, listed here are three of them, that consistently varied in abundance in the same exact directions um, between the two studies. So this is the American Gut Project study. This is the Human Microbiome Project study. These are the abundances uh, scaled on a log scale. Um, and these show the four ethnicity slash race groups we were using from the collected data. And there's a complementarity of the abundant variation for 12 groups. And notably, 11 out of 12 of these are what were deemed heritable in the literature. Heritable not being inherited from parents to offspring, but heritable meaning that the population genetic variation in the human genome has an association with the microbial abundances of these particular microbes. Um, seven out of 12 of these replicate for statistically detected heritability in three studies. The most highly heritable microbe is Christensen elaceae that was found um, by Ruth Lea's group to be sort of an undiscovered group of highly heritable bacteria in the gut that's influenced by genetic variation. This is also an obesity-linked uh, gut bacteria. Uh, that was established before we did our work, but we could then show that this obesity-linked uh, group of bacteria is also fundamentally linked to obesity in each of the groups, sometimes to varying degrees. So here we're showing black, Asian, white, and Hispanic, and three out of the four groups show a significant association where if you lack Christensen elaceae, you have a higher BMI than if you contain Christensen elaceae, you then have a lower BMI. Uh, so this is a trend that bears fruit, but is not universal. And perhaps that's an important aspect to thinking about where some of this course level data of social groups of ethnicity and race might lead us into more 
um, personalized or population level analyses uh, that certainly we see it in three groups, but not four groups. And that the microbiome variation between these groups may be an indicator of health or disease or potential for incidence differences by understanding this. Um, another way to look for features that are distinguishable are through machine learning models for microbiome pattern recognition. Um, in, in a very easy nutshell, if we take microbiome data, let's say, from the skin, and we have a computer model trained on finding what are the most important features that distinguish my microbiome from yours, for example, it then produces a model. We take that model and then apply it to data it hasn't seen before and ask if it can predict the right microbiome. And in this case, it might predict that those microbes that it hadn't been trained on came from me um, instead of from Sarah, for example. So we use these models in order to detect um, whether there are significantly distinguishable microbiomes between treatment groups or between population groups. And the way that's shown is on a XY axis of uh, true positive rate versus false positive rate. Ignore the details here. All that you need to know in terms of relative importance is a random classifier will draw a line right through the middle in which it can't distinguish me from Sarah with any confidence. But a better classifier or the best classifier will have a sharply, a sharply traced curve um, that, that leans onto this side of the box. Okay. So for the American Gut and Human Microbiome Project data, Ron, Sumbawa, and Andy took a look at uh, data from both data sets, and they were able to find that there were distinguishable patterns and features of the microbiome, meaning there are taxa within the microbiomes of the gut that could confidently, or I'd say semi-confidently distinguish microbiomes between different ethnicities and races. Um, so those curves are shown above the random portion here. Um, and while they're not perfect, they're indicating that there is a signal. Um, and what that signal can be reduced to is essentially percent accuracy estimates. So on a scale of about 70 to 80% accuracy, there is enough information in the gut microbiome to predict the social group that these microbes belong to which again indicates that at the whole microbiome level, not just at the specific taxa level, there are signals in the noise of the gut microbiome. That means that not everybody is the same and that random variation um, is not necessarily as random as we would think there may be structure to these microbiome patterns of variation. Those were done in adults. We've also done this in children uh, to kind of understand when do the microbiome patterns take course? When are they set up? And if we do this in children aged zero to 12 years old, we can see even stronger patterns of distinguishability and percent accuracy. Um, so this is uh, showing white, black, and Asian Pacific Islanders from a race perspective. This is showing Hispanic versus non-Hispanic from an ethnicity perspective. These curves are sharper, which means there's more accuracy. And in terms of the microbes that they distinguish, what we found extraordinarily fascinating is half of the children microbes that are considered distinguishable and important to the models were found in the adult microbiomes of previous those previous analyses I presented. So that means that there is something happening in early life that may persist throughout our lives that maintains this signature of microbiome variation uh, between these social groups. Why that is, I uh, know that's going to be a question and we can chat about it, still remains to be determined. I can tell you it does not appear to be related to vaginally acquired microbes because none of these 19 microbes are known to be vaginally acquired. So it may be something about lived experiences, dietary cultures, familial cultures that are setting up these microbes for long-term differences. As you can see in this chart from a childhood perspective, um, this is a chart of essentially microbial diversity. That is how many species are there and how are they distributed? The lower the number, the sort of less diversity there is in terms of the number of microbes and how they are compositionally distributed. This is a well-known pattern. Early in life, there's less diversity. Um, diversity increases through childhood and then sort of plateaus at age three and stays about the same uh, for adults, uh, for the adult lifespan as well. So just a, a point to note that there's less diversity here than there is after three months and onward. Um, there is clearly a microbiome variation signal here, uh, in part driven by the reduction early in life. And so if you were to take this data and then put it onto an ordination analysis, where each dot is a whole microbiome, 
and dots closer to each other are more similar microbiomes and dots farther away from each other are more different microbiomes, you can see that there's an age pattern structure that kind of gradients into an age flow here over time. Um, but the model and the statistics will tell us that there's a significant association with age and that 8% of the microbiome variation among these groups of uh, ages can be distinguished in the models. All right, so at ages zero to three months or six weeks to three months, um, and note that we have a little less data here. We cannot find a signal of microbiome variation across ethnicity or race. So there's no significant association here. And while the R squared values are low, um, this is sort of irrelevant because there's no significance to them. As soon as we move to three months onward, so this is three to 12 months, we start to detect significant associations with these groups. Um, and you'll note that our square values are modest, but this is pretty much what we see for most human traits associated with the microbiome, anywhere between one to five and maybe rarely as high as 10%, whether we're talking about genetics, diet, um, many factors kind of fall into this range. So this isn't um, low from our perspective, but certainly low relatively given that there are many factors that are influencing microbiome variation. From one to three years and three to 12 years, we continue to see this pattern of significantly associated microbiome variation um, with race and or ethnicity uh, with uh, modest uh, R-squared values as well. So, you know, having sort of settled on these patterns of microbiome variation at children's stages and adult stages, and some of these microbes persist for a while, we have to then ask the question of why is this occurring? How is it set up? And does it have any relevance for health and disease? So a basic question that we could ask is, does diet or geography account for microbiome variation across ethnicity or race? This is probably half of the hypotheses or people that I talk to about hypotheses will offer something about diet as an explanation. Now, what we did is we took a, a, a city data set uh, that we had a clinical cohort in one city. So essentially we're eliminating geography down to just a few zip codes, two to three zip codes. So we're kind of eliminating that factor. And then we thought we can construct a dietary intervention to test if diet can shift microbiome variation between these groups to become more similar or not. And that was sort of gonna be our test and at least in adulthood of whether the diet has an effect on microbiome variation. So in our study, which was small scale because this was very expensive and we're controlling the diet, so we're feeding all these individuals, we have individuals who are 18 to 40 years old. We controlled the sex to all females. We controlled to a healthy BMI. We controlled to individuals who were eating a Western diet, but we switched them onto a vegetarian diet purposely to try and see if we can converge their microbiomes when they all experience the same dietary shift. And our two groups are white or black. Uh, these were recruited in the Nashville area. Hypothesis is that the vegetarian diet intervention would eliminate microbiome variation or reduce microbiome variation uh, between the two groups. So we sampled saliva, blood, urine, and stool for various metabolomic and metagenomic metrics. Um, I will focus most of the talk on metagenomics today, um, though we do have some of the metabolomic and viromic data as well. Now, the dietary intervention is three plant-based meals and one snack per day that we provide them so that they can uh, all eat essentially the same diet. The calorie content, however, is personalized to maintain their own weight. So not everybody had the same abundance of food. They had the same nutrient profiles of food. Um, the calorie content uh, varied slightly based on the, in, uh, the BMIs that they came in with. Now, there was no caffeine or chocolate or alcohol. So this was a bit of a torture diet as well um, because these vices were eliminated. I feel bad for them, and I'm thankful that they participate in the study. And because we did metabolomics, if anybody cheated, we were also able to see who had a caffeine spike at the wrong time in the dietary intervention. And we would have taken that into account in our statistical analyses. I can happy to report only one person had a caffeine spike. Uh, so most were compliant. Okay, so this is the structure of the experiment. Um, so visit one is into our nutrition clinic where they provide a plasma, urine, and saliva sample. Um, they are coming in on their Western diet at this point. And then we provide them a four-day vegetarian diet where all the meals 
are essentially the same. They come back on day five after they've been on the diet. We do another plasma, urine, and saliva sample. Um, and then they are monitored for fecal samples from the first day in which they visited all the way out for another uh, nine days in total. This is a day minus one all the way up to day seven. So we're taking fecal samples whenever they provide them from home. And we also take oral samples um, uh, at visit one and visit two from a metagenomic perspective. The urine and plasma were used for metabolomics. So this is just cohort one. It's a small sample size. We also have cohort two that we kind of compare the data against of the similar sample size to see if the patterns are real or not. Now, if the dietary effect controls microbiome variation, then we should have a very simple hypothesis, which is microbiomes are different before the diet. They converge or become the same when they're on the diet, and then they are variable, uh, return to their sort of baseline state when they're off the diet. Alternatively, if the vegetarian diet has no impact, then the microbiome variation that we see at the beginning of the experiment will persist during the course of the experiment, and we won't be able to shake this social group variation um, that, we are, that we are seeing. So uh, this is a profile, another ordination profile of the dietary nutrients, okay? Not, not the microbiomes, just the dietary macro and micronutrients summed up into these ordination plots. And this is cohort one versus cohort two. The habitual diet is labeled in gray here. Each individual's uh, nutrient profiles of their own habitual diet from self-assessments are shown. And then the nutrient profiles of the individual day of the study, Day one, two, three, and four are shown in brown. As you can see in cohort one, the dietary nutrients are statistically different from the habitual diet. The same is also true for cohort two, but there's a little bit more variation in the habitual diet. So some of that, some of that, some of those outliers here kind of encompass the, the broader elliptical circle into the daily nutrients. But by and large, there's still a statistically significant difference between the vegetarian diet we provide and the habitual diet. Okay, so this is now microbial community data. And what this shows is metagenomic data turned into taxonomy for who's there from a microbial perspective of the stool and of the saliva. Each person is color coded and shown on this topology or tree distance matrix is the relationships of the microbiomes as they were on a diet. So this individual has a, has a microbiome that's changing with the diet on the diet throughout the course of the experiment. And as you can see, there's exquisite individuality to a person's microbial biome changes as they're going through our dietary treatment. The same is also true for the oral microbiome as well. Note we just have two samples from the two clinic visits they make instead of daily samples that the, uh, the subjects are taking along the way here. So, you know, I think that individuality is clearly the dominant effect here explains a lot of the variation. And diet actually has little effect on the gut microbiome composition. So here we have ordination plots that are color-coded to before, after, and during the diet. And there is a very, very slight statistically significant difference when individuals are on the diet versus before and after it. So this is a very modest uh, change. The diet has some effect in an individualized way, it's changing people's microbiome, but does not have this sort of massive shift the community into a different species composition when they're on the diet. So we do not see what we would have expected, that there would have been a massive dietary shift uh, uh, causing a microbiome shift. That doesn't occur. That certainly made us reflect on the literature that tends to overemphasize diet impacts on microbial diversity. And based on our meta-analysis of the literature, we actually learned on the backside of this that there are many studies of diet that actually do not shift the microbiome in significant ways. So this is the microbial community data from a taxonomy perspective across the two social groups, uh, cohort one versus cohort two. And here we can see the, the robustness in the signal that because the changes are more individualized than at a global level, we maintain a lot of the structure of the microbiome variation before, during, and after the diet. So all of the three stages are grouped together here, and that variation persists um, throughout the experiment, whether they're on the diet or whether they're not on the diet. And this occurs for both cohorts. So there are differences in taxonomic abundance. Uh, one example I'm showing here, we could find that 47% of the highly abundant, highly abundant taxa in cohort one 
are differentially abundant. So highly abundant would be, you know, greater than a threshold frequency that we set for the top abundant micro microbes. These um, differentially abundant and highly abundant microbes included five heritable taxa. So we are re replicating some of that heritability taxa information that we saw before in the American Gut Project and Human Microbiome Project data. 22% of the highly abundant taxa in cohort two are also differentially abundant, and this includes three heritable taxa, which one of which is shown here. Okay, so because we did metagenomics, we could move from taxonomy to gene functional potential and look at these trends as well. And the trends remain consistent with what I had told you just before about taxonomy, that whether it's before, during, and after, there's persistent metagenomic gene functional variation that Junhui, Liz, and Rob as the lead authors help find. So here you're looking at COGS, which are general gene functional category, groups of categories that um, distinguish gene groups from metabolism uh, of nucleic acids to metabolism of proteins, for example. Um, that, group, that data can be boiled down into single dots for an ordination analysis that continues to show significant variation in COG categories uh, between the two social groups. This is also true for antibiotic resistant genes or ARGs. These are, of course, potentially relevant from an antibiotic exposure perspective, as well as a potential threat of antibiotic resistant infections taking hold in, the, in these individuals. Um, note that at least in the oral metagenome, there's a large 13% of the variation can be explained um, by the social groups uh, for antibiotic resistant gene differences. Finally, casimes, which are carbohydrate digestive enzymes, also show consistent differences. The whopper here is the oral metagenome, where there are many bacteria that are um, differentially represented across the two groups for carbohydrate digestive enzymes as potentially um, differences in uh, oral microbiomes, whether they're from dietary legacies or whether they're from cultural legacies, are shaping a large metagenomic variation in the casime level in the oral site. Okay, so to kind of get to the guts of the matter here and sum this up in a way that's digestible, excuse the pun, um, what we're looking at here are the two cohorts, whether there were significant associations in the gut oral microbiome and gut virome for taxonomy, COGS, ARGs, and casimes across ethnicity, antibiotic use, hormonal contraceptive use. Okay, those three categories are repeated on the bottom. And just to draw your awareness to the gut microbiome is strongly and consistently variable in both cohorts for self-identity, antibiotic use, and hormonal contraceptive use that we monitored because our subjects were all females. Now, remember, antibiotic use was something that occurred um, probably six months before they started our diet. We required that as an input variable. So there may be some legacy effect of prior antibiotic use on the microbiomes that we're sampling in our particular study, but they were not on antibiotics, nor had they been close to using antibiotics um, in our particular study. Another aspect is the gut virome is screaming a signal as well, that there are statistical differences in all of these nine categories, uh, nine blocks across these three categories. And what I find interesting is that the gut virome kind of wins the day, that in the gut, the virome contains more signatures of significance of differences between ethnicity, antibiotic use, or hormonal contraceptive use than the gut microbiome it does itself. And I want to pause and reflect on that a little bit because the gut virome uh, is more variable than the microbiome. So these are some of these broad gene functional categories that I'd mentioned before, uh, labeled in colors. This is uh, the virome, the gut virome sampled early in 2010 that shows that there's a lot of variation in the abundance of these categories between individuals. And then the microbiomes are almost identical in their gene functional categories. So whereas the microbiome looks pretty much like a match for match for match for each individual, the virums contain more unique signatures and information. And I think that that means the virome may consistently be a more sensitive signature to lived experiences, to influences on the gut microbiome than the microbiome itself. And it certainly raises our aperture to more deeply focusing on the virome as a more sensitive window into these changes. Now, getting back to the self-identity and social group aspects of this data, 
you know, this is an interesting trend line that's happening in the human microbiome sciences. The use of ethnicity and race is on a line up, straight line up. It's also generating a lot of conversation about we need to move beyond these course categories for their general, generally lack of information about what are the causes. They represent structural racism groups. They represent social aspects, lived experiences. But yet, you know, we continue to use these in the medical field without sort of getting beneath the hood of them uh, in the life sciences. And it's clear to me that the microbiome, because it's more sensitive to lived experiences, needs to move beyond this as well. Um, it's not a thing that's going away, though. You know, just uh, just a few months ago, there was a cancer cell meta-analysis that showed that race is also a key determinant of the human intertumor microbiome, that is, the microbial communities within human cancer cells. Uh, race sort of stands out as the, the screaming signal of, of the data sets. And, you know, from a health disparities perspective, I think that's potentially relevant, that it allows us to see windows into um, where is this course variable relevant to thinking about disease incidence differences, disparities in care, uh, and then how can we modulate that in, in policies and also in our microbiome knowledge. So, um, you know, we're unbiasing the microbiome studies. We and others are clearly uh, know that we need to do this. Um, the impacts on health disparities could be through social, behavioral, and environmental factors that lead to or guide or will solve some health disparities. And that's particularly the, the sort of the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel is that by studying these patterns we and changing our discourse about what are the causes of microbiome variation and our structures of how we're studying it, we can start to move into a more um, applied lens of policies and strategies that will include more inclusive therapeutics and diagnostics, um, as well as recommendations. So um, I'll end on some high level thoughts, which is that this is an active area of discussion in the microbiome field. And if you're not familiar, I encourage you to kind of check out many of these articles on uh, ethnicity, race, human microbiome variation, um, and how the field is confronting this and moving forward with it as well. At Penn State, uh, and as part of the Microbiome Center outreach, we are really interested in working with social scientists, uh, geographic scientists, environmental scientists, so that we can change the dialogue and discoveries. You know, the life scientists are, are have different perceptions than social scientists about these terms. And we need to have sort of this, these two communities come together and find a way forward that's better for both fields. The science is certainly moving fast. Um, there's lots of factors that could go into some of the correlations that we're seeing. The population health scientists are really well positioned for this work. Many of you already are in this area or know that this is coming as a priority factor. Um, I think we need more longitudinal data across life to try and understand what are the lived experiences that are triggering um, microbiome legacies or microbiome changes during an individual's lifespan. Uh, we need more functional mechanistic results. Who are the contacts these individuals have? What are the details on long-term diets, stresses, et cetera? We need uh, better experimental population strategies. So, you know, one of the common approaches that even we've been doing here is comparing ethnicity and racial groups. But it's clear we don't need to do this. If we have enough data within one underrepresented group, we can just look at social, dietary, uh, familial variation within one minoritized group and get a better sense of what are the factors influencing microbiome variation within just one group. That seems like a smart way to go forward as well. We need those big cohorts to do that, and maybe Penn State can contribute to that. Um, we will eventually probably need social intervention strategies and policies to maybe change the direction of microbiome developments um, and then the disparities that could be triggered from those baseline differences. Um, and we may need more personalized therapeutics that take into account um, these some of the course level variation that we're seeing between social groups, but then even finer level variation beyond that. Um, I think a lot about this uh, developmental origins of health and disease hypothesis or DOHAD hypothesis because the microbiome variation between these groups is, is set up early in life. Um, not at not at birth, but after birth, apparently. And that's an early critical window when microbiome composition may have an outsized effect or at least a legacy on shaping what other microbes occur later in life and what are the long-term health impacts of that. Important to reflect on that there's low microbiome diversity in that three-month period, um, that zero to three-month period. And so those 
changes could sort of set up shop of what remains persistent from childhood on to adulthood. That would then influence a lot of factors as microbiome diversity increases, but how that microbiome diversity increases could be influenced by what's set up uh, early in life. So some food for thought. Um, the Microbiome Center is very active right now in facilitating collaborations, and we want to do more of that with your input uh, between University Park and Hershey. These are some of the multidisciplinary units and departments that are now collaborating, interacting with the Microbiome Center. There's probably more, and if I don't have you on the list and you know that, please let me know as well. Um, these are some of the foci groups that I've uh, had a chance to participate in, in thinking about and helping um, inflammatory bowel disease, allergies and asthma, cancer, fatty liver disease, and health disparities. Uh, again, let's continue to grow this list and expand our abilities to analyze diversity uh, at a greater level than we do right now. Okay, I'll just end on um, a couple high-level thoughts on our education and outreach. Uh, Sarah mentioned that we run this project called Discover the Microbes Within the Wolbachia Project. Um, for those that may have children or students interested in learning biotechnology, um, we offer a free series of high school and uh, entry-level college curriculum for students to sample arthropods, um, DNA extract, PCR, gel, and then 16S sequence an amplicon for the Wolbachia bacteria that occurs in half of the world's arthropod species. Um, we've trained thousands and thousands and thousands of students across the world, many in the U.S. and now beyond in 19 countries. Um, we've had some really cool partnerships. I'll just highlight one. Um, this high school in New Jersey and a high school in Israel got together and they have a global collaboration where they sample the same mosquito species and compare the frequencies of these Wolbachia bacteria between the two countries and they do Zooms to kind of have a symposium get together and talk about it. Um, we're interested in providing these kinds of biotechnologies through the microbial world uh, experiments. If you know anybody, please let us know and I can connect you to the project directly. Um, finally, this is our, our silly, fun, warm group. Uh, we had a, a meeting, I think, when I first got to campus in the springtime. I'm looking forward to this warm weather again when it arises. Thank you for listening. I will uh, take the slides down and be happy to answer any of the questions. Uh, look forward to them. Thank you. Thanks, Seth. Um... We don't have any questions in the chat and no questions in the Q&A. There is one other secret way you can ask a question, which is to raise your hand and I can unmute you if you'd rather put it to words. Um, I mean, I have a number of geeky questions I could ask. Yeah, um, get us started. Um, so what, um, oh, just as I said that, any influence of exercise? There are, um, I'm not well versed in this area, but there are indications that um, elite athletes, for example, have different gut microbiomes um, than the rest of us. May we all be so privileged to be an elite athlete. Uh, so I, I do think that there will be aspects of exercise and metabolism that directly impact the microbiome. You could sort of think about also optimum energy extraction and reuse from elite athletes that are, you know, may have a more optimized gut microbiome for energy extraction and, and use into the metabolism of the system. So, yeah, I think if you did a keyword search on um, athletes and gut microbiome variation, you'd probably find a, a few more details on that. Cool. Thank you. And in the chat, a question about uh, schools in the Hershey area with regard to the sequencing project and is there a way to you know help with that thank you yeah so we are deeply interested in using hershey and the 24 campus network to reach our pennsylvanians and so if you can uh directly say i've got a school or i've got a student in a school who would love this maybe make some contacts and ping that to me i can ping it over to our wabakia project team and we can work on that this Part of the, the the inspiration for us to be at Pennsylvania was because of this wonderful land grant multi campus system that we can reach rural students with, and we're very interested in doing that. Um, so yes, yes, yes. 
Uh, and please let us know if we can make some connections for schools or students that you have in mind. We work with teachers directly, which they love because they get direct access to the scientists who are doing this work. We work with students directly when they are troubleshooting, and the students can even report their data on a website database called the Wabakia Project Database that provides a DOI so that they can have a publication link on their resumes, for example. You can also imagine that students who know how to do DNA extraction and PCR will show up to college and research lab and pretty much impress the heck out of them. And they're going to be highly recruited to get into labs because they've already got those skills that were developed in this series. Thank you for that question. And I hope that that answer provides a gateway to connect over options that we could explore together. And Maria had a chase to that, which was about the SMART program for structural biology. Maybe I'm not familiar with that. Yeah. Do you want me to unmute you, Maria? I can do that. Um, yeah, so this is a program where we uh, partner with um, local high schools um, in um, low socioeconomic area school districts underfunded school districts. Um, and we teach high school student, high school teachers about structural biology. It's yes. through Penn State University Park. Yes, fantastic. And it seems like it'd be a great partnership for that. No doubt, because we could sort of move right from Amplicon sequence to yep. protein <laughs> structures yep. and then get, get another lab in there, right? Yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah. Um, I, I presume I could just do a little web search on the SMART program and we'll find that. I can send you some information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Love it. Cool. Um, from Andrew Hopkirk, training opportunities for graduate students who are interested in learning more about clinical microbiome research. So maybe I was hoping you'd talk a little bit more about the dual title program because that seems like that might be the, the venue here. So Okay, so the dual title program is um, was launched a few months ago from the Plant Pathology and Environmental Microbiology program. It's now spreading by paperwork through any graduate program that wants to adopt the dual title degree. Here on the University Park campus, we're working with biology, entomology, um, food science, biochemistry, and molecular biology, anthropology. So we are heavily invested in expanding this out as far and wide as we can. If there's a graduate program that you're affiliated with that I didn't mention, please let me know, because if we can work with that program and, and the director of graduate studies of that program, we can start to get the paperwork going as well, and we make it pretty easy. The dual title degree means that a PhD students graduate with a formal degree in their main program plus the microbiome sciences. There's some credit work, modest credit work that can overlap with existing coursework. And really the only requirement is coming to the microbiome seminar series, which is a basic one level credit course. And we meet Friday around lunchtime and, and have some microbiome center, uh, wonderful microbiome center seminars. But I should also mention, if you're interested in that, any of that information, um, the Microbiome Center website through the Huck Institutes has a join the center link. Uh, please fill out your information there and we'll get you that information if you're not already on it. If you feel like there's more information that you can connect over the dual title degree in your particular graduate program, reach out to me directly and we'll make those connections happen so we can work on that. For clinical microbiome research, um, yes, this is an area that we should be thinking heavy about. Where I think we offer resources already is through our bioinformatics analysis workshops and our dog training group, our data analysis working group, because ultimately the folks who do clinical work already know how to collect samples. They know how to store those samples, but they may not know the nuances of a microbiome study and they may not know the nuances of how to analyze and get started with microbiome data. And that's where our bioinformatics and data analysis working group workshops really kick in. We offer a one week uh, boot camp, if you will, in August that trains um, newcomers to the Penn State campus as well as existing members by our Microbiome Center faculty before coursework and things get busy. And we announce that in our email newsletter um, in the summertime. Once a month, our email newsletter has a bioinformatics workshop. 
uh, either sponsored by industry representatives who come and talk to our community or by the dog group that's training our local community. So those are places to start. For specific projects, um, it's very possible that we could start working group discussions around projects that are about to, to launch or are ongoing and provide advice about how to get those best structured with our expert microbiome scientists. So yeah, I think there's there's room for further development, uh, room for opportunities, and the door is wide open. So thank you for, for bringing that up. Good. I will just make a plug for getting on the mailing list for the center too, because there's always interesting stuff in there. I love how Seth's team has really picked up. There's links to seminars that you might not have ever known about or just articles or ideas. It's uh, I'm, it's good fun, even if you weren't doing the research. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, we, um, we really want to add value and be the best we can be for all you guys. We do think we have one of the great microbiome centers and we continue to want to grow. So if you feel like that's an aspiration that you're excited about, please do join us. Smoking status in subjects in your diet study. Uh, that's a good question. I'm uh, guessing, though, I'd have to double check that we eliminated smoking as a variable. Um, we were pretty much hawks on trying to have as controlled of a human population as we could. Uh, that's kind of the bread and butter of how we do research in my lab. And so we wanted to scale some of that to, to this program. I'd have to double check, but I'm strongly guessing we eliminated smoking as a variable. So, you know, I was curious about four days. Is that enough? Do you think? This is a great question. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, there's surprising variation in dietary impacts on studies. In the classic Peter Turnbaugh experiment in one of the high profile journals, it only took 24 hours to flip the microbiome from a vegetarian-like microbiome to a carnivore microbiome, to a high Western microbiome. That got the limelight, that gets the press, it still does today. Um, that suggested that four days would be long enough. After we saw our data, we took another look and realized that there are a few studies that show big dietary impacts and there are many others that don't. Um, and so it's quite possible, Sarah, that four is not enough, that we may need four months to see a difference. We may need four years to see a difference, or maybe there would never be a difference because of the historical legacy effect that's set up throughout lifetime. Um, those experiments would be very complicated to do because it's hard to control the diet for that long. You could certainly input certain nutrients, like give folks fiber, but to control the whole diet, uh, you know, we're talking just for the seven, eight day trial we did, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so we're left with that question. I'm more keen on what are the social aspects of people's lives that set up these differences now. And um, I'm working with social geographic environmental scientists uh, to figure that out. And so if you are too, please reach out to us. I know several of our College of Medicine PIs are thinking about this and writing grants uh, around uh, these kinds of variables as well. Well, and really, if you think of it as being a constellation of factors yeah. that, that do, if you're looking at the social, you're probably picking up some dietary mm -hmm. factors at the same time, right? So exactly. That's... Yep. I, right. I actually myself went vegan for a year and a half because of the uh, early microbiome dietary studies that suggested, you know, eating lots of leafy greens increases microbiome diversity. Um, that's, that's very robust. You know, if you do it long term, you can increase your microbiome diversity. Um, I enjoyed the benefits of that, although I didn't last longer than a year and a half. <laughs> so you do experiment on yourself is what you're saying, right? Pretty much. <laughs> All right. Uh, question about caffeine. Why not allow caffeine? Uh, caffeine can be a really strong meta met metabolite in the metabolomics. And so we didn't want it to overcrowd the other metabolites. Uh, so that's why we cut it out. Uh, same for some of the chocolate metabolites as well. Uh, things that people are addicted to and eat a lot can kind of swamp out other variables in the metabolomics. Excellent. Thank you. Any final questions? If not, I would very much like to thank um, Seth for sharing this hour of his day with us and putting this together. And we will, as you know, these are recorded. So this will be posted on the research developments media library, but also um, it's going to be posted, it sounds like on the microbiome centers media library as well. So you can get it either place. You might find some even more interesting videos if you went there looking for it, because I'm sure they're kind of trying to create a, a, a 
uh, library of, of interest as well. Yes, we well, also have a YouTube page if people want to check that out as well. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. All right, we'll do all the advertising here. All right, excellent. Thank you very much. Lots of claps. Thank you. Um, enjoyed it quite a bit. We'll be in touch. Bye, everybody.